So what is the multiverse? The multiverse is the idea that it might be that our universe isn't the only one, that there might be uh, more universes beyond our own, beyond the boundaries of our own. Uh, and some people are even saying there might be an infinite number of universes beyond our own. And why is this seen as sort of a problem or that, that, that spans religion and science? Yeah. So the reason is that the multiverse idea has been around for a long time. I mean, in, in Western philosophy, it actually has about a 2,500 year history. Uh, but it's come really resurging back in the last couple of decades, um, partly because physicists are looking for an answer to why the universe seems so finely tuned. Um, why it seems like all of the constants of nature are precisely set so that the universe can, uh, can emerge, can sustain life things like that. Um, and the danger for physics is that if you say that the universe seems really well tuned for life, that the theologians can rush in and say, aha, God did that fine tuning, right? God is a kind of cosmic mix maker who's like setting this amount of gravity and this amount of dark energy and this amount of electrons, right? Um, and so a rival explanation to God is, no, 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 actually, there are an infinite number of universes that take on all sorts of different configurations over infinite time. Every once in a while, one comes along that happens to work, and we seem to be in one of those universes that works. Okay. Yeah. Could that argument still work with a god, though? Absolutely. This is the thing about theology, right? It's remarkably uh, resilient, right? A theologian can always say, right, fine, there's a multiverse, good. God created the multiverse, and then the multiverse created the universe. So it's not actually. Uh, any kind of argument. The multiverse isn't any argument against the existence of God. Sometimes physicists think it is. It's not. Um, it just sort of takes some of his jobs away, but it's not, it doesn't disprove anything. So I actually think that it's kind of uninteresting to be stuck in this back and forth over whether or not God exists, right, with respect to the multiverse. I think the more interesting question is, um, what kinds of new stories are we getting from these multiverse cosmologies? Like new stories about where we come from, where we're headed, what the universe is like. Um, these are all questions that myths used to ask and answer for us uh, in, in sort of any society other than our own right now. This would be the function of myths. Um, physics is doing it for us now. So I like to sort of look at those stories and see what kinds of values they're encoding, uh, what they're telling us about ourselves, whether we like them or not, right? Are they, are they telling us good, helpful things? Um, yeah. So what are some of these new stories that they're telling us? Right, so I mean, there are, there are tons of them. If you ask, you know, most theoretical physicists, they'll say, right, well, there's only one respectable one. The respectable one is that there's this sort of primordial sea of inflationary energy. Inflationary energy pushes space out really, really super fast. Um, and this primordial sea uh, races and races and races outward. And every once in a while, that energy kind of turns off and allows little pockets of stable space time to form. And those are universes. So you get these universes nucleating out of this sort of primordial sea, like sort of pockets of um, air in Swiss cheese or something like that. So universe, 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 universe. This is called eternal inflation. And the idea is that our universe is one of just these bubbles in this eternal sea of inflating sort of hyper space time. That's one of them. Um, there are other theories that argue that every time a uh, massive, massive star uh, collapses and forms a black hole. Uh, you get, so that you've, you've probably seen drawings, right, of space time kind of going like this. Uh, you get uh, an infinite amount of stuff in uh, in zero space. You have, you have stuff crammed into no space. So you've got a sort of point of infinite density. That point is called a singularity. Um, physicists also talk about singularities uh, as, or the singularity, as having been uh, what the Big Bang was, right? A bunch of stuff crammed into a point of no size. Uh, so the idea is that every time a black hole forms, you're actually producing a new universe on the other side of the black hole. So we may have, right, hundreds of millions of black holes in our sort of visible universe, and each of them, the idea is, would have potentially a universe inside it, and conversely, we're sitting on the inside of somebody else's black hole, right, in that universe. That's another idea, uh, an idea that people love to ridicule is the idea that our universe is all sitting on a three plus one dimensional membrane, and that that membrane has like a partner universe, which is also a three plus one, three plus one, three of space, one of time, and they're sort of hovering near each other, separated by this fourth dimension of space that nobody can see, but it's like right there. So this other universe would be like right here, just closer than anything to us, but we just can't cross the gap to that other universe. That every like couple trillion years or so, these two membranes smash together, that's the Big Bang. The universe is destroyed, recreated all the time, and, and we've got this kind of symbol crashing that 
makes and unmakes the universe. These are some ideas, right? I find this fascinating, right? Why not look at these new stories and, and ask what it is they're telling us? So then how do you move from this like highly scientific realm of mm -hmm. these different theories to then looking at how what this means for our values or sort of in the mm -hmm. way that myths used to do? Yeah, um, well, so clearly um, these stories are all trying, I mean, they have lots of differences among them, right? Um, so uh, we could start looking at what those differences are. So the black hole guys are really excited that they have uh, what they call an evolutionary mechanism, that if, if a new universe is being formed from, say, a parent universe, it retains many of those characteristics of the old universe, but then uh, sort of tweaks them. So it's basically evolution uh, that's uh, driving uh, the formation of universes. So they're very excited about evolution. Uh, the, um, the membrane smashing together guys are very excited about uh, numerical simplicity and elegance. They're very upset with the idea of like infinite numbers of universes being spawned all over the place. They're like, no, 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 we need, we need simplicity. We need just two of them, just infinite recycling. Um, they're recyclers. They're <laughs> so you, you can see, you can, you can do that work of seeing what the different values are among the different physicists who are setting forth these very different stories. Um, but certainly what all of them are trying to do is to account for the emergence of the universe, the uh, sustenance of the universe, the governance of the universe, and the ultimate destruction of the universe without any kind of transcendent principle, without any sort of divine figure, or any figure outside the universe that's like regulating the whole thing. Um, but it's not to say there's no regulation. Um, there are regulating forces inside the universe. Um, so usually you get gravity and the cosmological constant or dark energy kind of working with and against each other to produce and to sustain the universe. These, I'd like to say, we can look at as, a, as sort of new divinities or new heroes, right, who are, who are sort of making and shaping the universe. We get these sort of new mythic figures who are emerging. And they're not, again, outside the universe, they're inside the universe. So one thing these stories are telling us is that we're not so much abandoning the idea of the gods. We're just trying to pull them like all the way into the universe and see how they're functioning through the natural world itself. Um, I think it, it tells us a little bit about a kind of collective desire to see the operations that we would traditionally have called sacred in the natural world itself. Right? See how the natural world itself is doing that work of universe making. So do you argue that there is a transcendent figure? No. No? <laughs> no. I don't argue there isn't. I don't argue there is. Um, I don't think it's a game anybody can win. Um, if it were possible to uh, prove the existence of God, uh, or if it were possible to disprove the existence of God, meaning a trans transcendent sort of humanoid figure outside, if it were possible to prove the existence of that guy or disprove the existence of it, somebody would have done it by now, right? Like somebody would have come up with a decent explanation. It's been thousands of years of attempts to prove, to disprove, blah, 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 blah. like those were really smart people. It's not possible, right? You can always make arguments on one side or the other. So I don't try to do that at all. Um, what I want to ask instead is, insofar as the word God has traditionally encoded our deepest values, so traditionally, think for monotheistic societies, um, what we mean by God is a single, male, anthropomorphic, very powerful force, disembodied. Right? That tells us that what the West's values are are singularity, oneness, maleness, disembodiment, uh, humanoidness. Right? It, it just reflects our own values at us. So if traditionally God has encoded our most um, powerful values. Uh, what I want to ask instead is, uh, how can we think about God differently? Right? How, can we, uh, how can we look at the values that we have that I think are beginning, particularly in any kind of culture that's beginning to um, value anew the uh, world that we're part of, the ecological set of systems that we're part of. Um, if our values are, are tending more toward things like um, relation and mutuality and uh, the sort of uh, participation of all creatures rather than just the uh, dominance of humans. Um, how would we have to change what our understanding of what God looks like in order to reflect those values? Um, what kinds of gods do we want? I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, of, of societies 
all over the place. We sort of make and ditch gods depending on how useful they are. We could do that too. We could be like, all right, what are, what are, what are useful gods look like? Uh, so I'd, I take a much more pragmatic, I think, approach to it than any kind of uh, ontological approach. I'm not trying to argue there is or isn't a god. I want to say, like, what would it mean to think about god productively and helpfully and ethically? And do you think that there is that need for divinity? Do no. you not see, like, could atheism yeah. fill these? Uh, sure. I, you know, I think, I think that... Uh, no, nobody needs needs divinity for anything. Real. I mean, well, no, some people do. I've got a friend. Uh, he's a former Jesuit priest, and somebody asked him, uh, "Could you marry my husband and me? We're hoping to get married, um, but could you could you do it without God?" And he was like, "Do it without? I, I can't open the refrigerator without God. Like, of course I can't marry you without." So, right for some people, it's absolutely not an option. Right? Some people uh, absolutely orient their lives around their understanding of what God is, whether that's the earth, whether that's a father in the sky, whether that's totally fine, not a problem. Um, but I don't think that any, some sort of notion of God, whatever it is, is necessary, for example, to lead an ethical life, right? Um, I don't think that it's necessary to lead a meaningful life. I don't, people can lead perfectly ethical and meaningful lives as atheists, they do. Um, it's just that I find, um, as somebody who has traditionally studied religion, that often people who think of themselves as atheists, what they really just mean is, I don't like the idea of an eternal dude in the sky standing over us and giving us rules. And I want to say, like, you know what? Actually, most people who believe in God don't either. <laughs> like, right? most, most people don't like that idea. Um, you may not have to ditch completely the concept of divinity in order to um, in order to criticize the, the sort of dangerous um, position of that kind of that kind of de deity, you can give up that kind of deity um, and still have other ways of thinking about divinity. Um, do we have to have them? Absolutely not. Um, but I do think that the um, particularly, and this is what I've been working on recently, um, the natural sciences and the social sciences are producing these sort of unintentional theologies um, by ascribing again to the natural world all of the functions that we used to ascribe to divinity. So they think they're atheistic. I'm actually arguing they're kind of pantheistic, right? That the divinity is sort of suffused throughout the natural world itself. Is that an interesting move to make? I'm not sure. I think, right, I think it's fun, um, but I, I'm certainly not out there to convince any atheist that he's actually not an atheist or something like that. And how has that been taken by uh, the physicists or like social scientists that were working on such things? Do they recognize in your work uh, mm -hmm. that divinity might exist in their own work, or has there been some opponents? You know, some people actually find it charming, right? Some people will be like, ah, oh, really? Am I, am I like a modern day myth maker? Am I a modern day theologian? That's fascinating. Like, as long as I'm not trying to say that really they need Jesus or something like that, they're totally fine with it. Um, other people will say that it's just unnecessary, right? That it's, it's unnecessary to add uh, the concept of divinity to the concept of the natural world. If you've got a natural world that's self-sufficient, that's auto-creative, that works, uh, that where all the parts are um, working in you know, different kinds of collaborations to make what emerges emerge, you don't need to like add divinity onto that. Atheism kind of functions just just fine on its own. Um, perfectly fine point to make. I think there's something to be said though for working on the concept of. God. Um, the theorist Hortense Spillers says that our concepts do violence in the world, right? Our, our concepts like do work of establishing some people as more important than other people, some species as more important than other people. And I really worry about the concept of God. I really worry about it. I worry about the work that it does. I worry about the way that it still seems to establish humans as superior to every other species. I worry about the way that it still seems to establish men as more important than women and like gendered others. Um, I worry about the way that because of Europe's traditional um, alignment with that particular monotheistic god, it tends to establish the supremacy of Europe and by extension America over every other region of the world. Um, so I worry that if we don't do work on that concept of God, we just leave it there intact as um, grounding all of these hierarchies. And then we can say, oh, but it doesn't exist. 
right? That God doesn't exist. But that doesn't get rid of all of those conceptual uh, adherences that keep those uh, dualities and those hierarchies in place. I think there's something to be said for like working on the concept itself to say, you know what? Divinity does not mean omnipotence. It doesn't mean you can just go in and do whatever you want. It means a kind of relational negotiating power because this is the way that we see that nature works, right? Um, nature doesn't just sort of destroy everything and then recreate stuff anew. Nature works with what it has, with all sorts of you know, bacteria and ants and mushrooms and trees all kind of doing their part to make a forest a forest. Um, that, I think, is a more productive mo uh, um, way of thinking about uh, divinity than a, a dude in the sky. And again, I think if we leave it to um, particularly conservative monotheists to define what God means and the rest of us just sort of sneak off into atheism, they've got God, right? They've got our most powerful concept, and I'd rather, I'd rather do work on that concept. And is it possible then to have a form of like theism that isn't that sort of dude in the sky in the way that it's like someone that is higher than uh, humans and that is mm -hmm. controlling uh, controlling us? Mm -hmm. Does pantheism sort of, how can you radically break that away yeah. from like an idea of divinity? Yeah, so the, so the idea of pantheism would be something like, and I say would be because it's not clear to me that we've got a decent pantheism at the moment. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to kind of stitch it together and what it might look like. But the idea of pantheism would be that what we mean by God is the natural world itself. Right? And by natural, I mean also the cultural world, right? technologies, right? Every, um, the, the, the world around us, the material world around us, which is also a world of ideas. Um, that stuff is God. Um, how can we get away with calling it God? Um, because what we mean by God is the source of all things, the life in all things, the end of all things. Um, why not just say, like, that's, that's what we mean by the universe. It's what gives us life. It's what right, sustains us. It's what swallows us back and then makes us into something else by recombining our atoms. Um, right, so pantheism would mean something like what we mean by God is the universe itself. Um, so then we want to ask, well, like, how does the universe work? And how does, how, does, um, how does the world work? And we can think about it on a small scale, about the earth or like a patch of forest, right? How does the natural world work to get stuff done? And really the agents of doing stuff in the universe are not human beings. It's like bacteria, right? Bacteria are amazing creators. What would it mean if we like thought for a little while about the creative work that bacteria, like a bacterial theology, right? About these like microscopic agents as the, the engines of life, as the engines of newness, as the engines of... What, it, what would it mean to think about um, rather than, you know, consciousness or rationality as being some divine principle, which is usually what we, you know, this characteristic we ascribe to God. What about like gravity or magnetism, these amazingly powerful forces that hold things together, that drive things apart, that get things, like start somewhere else, start from some different place in the universe that does creative work um, and build your model of divinity there. And I almost think you could start from kind of anywhere, like a mustard seed or an acorn or an, right? I think it, that kind of pantheism would encourage us to look all over the place and see how and where we see like newness, creativity, productivity at work. And has uh, pantheism had a history what is the history of pantheism? It's a really hilarious history. Pantheism doesn't have a great history. Okay. Um, it was coined as a term at the uh, outset of the 18th century. Uh, it was coined as just like a nasty word, um, a, like a bad thing to call a dopey <laughs> philosopher. Um, the dopey philosopher in question was a man named Baruch Spinoza, who uh, died toward the end, uh, middle end of the, the uh, 17th century. Um, and he had this idea that he, he, was, he used the term God or nature. Deus sive natura, um, God or nature. Uh, and he sets forth this idea. He gets excommunicated from his Jewish community in Amsterdam. Um, and for hundreds of years afterwards, in order to gain a university professorship in uh, Germany, for example, you had to take a pledge against Spinoza. You had to promise that you did not affirm this. Um, so the position known as pantheism, uh, again, was, was just like a a nasty name, like a bad thing to call a terrible person. Um, it's got a bit of a resurgence in sort of 18th and 19th century German idealism, but most of those German guys who take it up end up then making fun of it when they get older and kind of ridiculing it and converting to a more orthodox form of Christianity. Um, there's, so again, there's not a great history of pantheism. I think you can see it um, 
kind of subtly at work in, say, uh, some of the German poets, uh, some of the English poets, even uh, some of the American transcendentalists. Uh, but folks don't tend to sort of take up the cause of like the banner of pantheism. Um, so again, part of the work that I'm trying to do now is to kind of stitch it together, to like find some friends, to cobble it together. Uh, William James, uh, who's an American philosopher, um, pragmatist, and uh, psychologist in the beginning of the 20th century, begins to say, you know what, it looks like pantheism is the only viable option for us these days. Like we can't believe in this humanoid father god anymore. We're probably going to have to be pantheists. He's like, but I'm not really quite sure what this means. So he starts getting, getting thinking about it, but he doesn't quite say it for. That's, that's what this work is trying to do. And do you feel like this would have uh, would it have radical sort of uh, political ramifications? I my um, certainly my hope would be that it could have radical ecological um, ramifications. Um, the uh, there's a historian of ideas, Lynn White, who argued toward the late 1960s. Uh, he, he wrote a piece called The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. And what he was saying was um, that the problem with ecology dates back to the um, overcoming of paganism by monotheism. And he says, you know, in a, in a pagan world, if the rocks are alive, if the trees are alive, if the rivers have personalities, you can't just take them, right? You can't just cut the trees down with impunity if they have, if they're spirits, if they're living things. Um, you can't just remove mountaintops if the mountain is a sacred living being. Um, you have to at least ask a river before you pollute it, right? Um, but he says that the problem with the triumph of monotheism is that what monotheism does is it reserves all agency and all life um, for conscious beings, God and then humans who are made in God's image. Everything else is just dead matter. Animals, you just use them with impunity. Rocks, rivers, trees, who cares, right? Um, so I'd like to think about um, if, like, if we are thinking about um, rocks, rivers, trees, bacteria, mushrooms as animate, as getting stuff done, as in some way um, having uh, um, agency and even maybe personality, which is what a lot of animists teach us, that they have personalities. Um, I think it would be real, a lot harder to, say, frack the earth for natural gas. Uh, if that earth were a living, animate thing, um, and perhaps even sharing in what we think of as divine. Um, so that's that's kind of the hope. The hope is um, to, to, to sort of reanimate the landscape. I'm not the first person to do this. There are right, new materialist philosophers who are doing this constantly, who are sort of cobbling together different ontologies uh, to see the way that we can think of even like lead and steel as animate. Um, and certainly that what we call the, the, the landscape as animate. Um, what I'm trying to argue is that we can use this work to start um, also to tearing down the concept of divinity as again enshrining the importance of humanity and sort of human comfort over everything else. And would you go as far as uh, seeing consciousness in uh in all beings, in the rocks and the rivers. Right, the so here's the thing. Yeah, I, I guess I could say yes, but then I get worried about consciousness because consciousness is the thing that we have, is the, the, the um, power, the faculty that we've traditionally uh, um, reserved for human beings, right? Um, so I can see the sort of generosity in saying, look, not only are dolphins and dogs and um, whales conscious, uh, but also rocks and rivers and trees are conscious, particles are conscious, quarks are conscious, things like that. Um, but I worry a little bit about the way that that kind of remakes the whole universe in the image of the human. Um, so I like to talk, I guess, a little more about um, them having like personality or agency, uh, which or, or animacy, which feels a little less like it's taking the stuff that is supposed to distinguish us and then seeing ourselves everywhere in the universe. Um, but sure, I, you know, I, th 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 that's the position known as panpsychism, right? The idea that uh, everything down to the level of the quantum has a kind of consciousness or proto-consciousness. Um, yeah, I, 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 I affirm the panpsychist, uh, sort of panpsychic viewpoint as um, as helpful and as useful. I guess I just um, I just worry that it then ends up reestablishing a kind of uh, chain of being where um, photons and electrons have a kind of 
proto like primitive consciousness and then um, bacteria have like a little more consciousness and then you know who knows about viruses maybe they have a little more and then you you know work your way up and you work your way up and you write and then finally humans have like serious consciousness right you get that same establishment of that hierarchy of being if you're trying to see consciousness all the way down so that would be where I would depart from the panpsychists panpsychics and what would be uh, where should the folks be on sort of raising awareness of pantheism should it be in like raising awareness of how uh sort of the god in the sky ideology is sort of structure society or do you think we should be right. sort of writing new myths uh based on pantheism or where where is it taking you wow yeah i think it's important to do both of these things at the same time i think it's important to do the critical work of showing uh the damage that the god in the sky has traditionally done i think that's very important um and then uh, at the moment where I think a lot of us these days are starting to say like, all right, no, forget it, we're atheists. Um, at that point to say, but this doesn't mean we don't get to have stories. It doesn't mean we don't get to have even sacred stories and sacred myths. And if you're interested in doing that, again, um, start at any, any place around you. Start anywhere around you, in the natural, technical uh, world. Start with the way that cameras work. Start with the way the daffodils work, Start, right? And, and kind of go from there. See what it is that made that thing itself. Right? What is it? Um, what, it? What are the sets of materials that go into making a camera a camera? Um, what's the like the human labor? What's the animal labor? What's the right? And the case of the camera and the, you kind of start from any object and see all the stuff that goes into it. Then you'll see you'll begin to see this sort of relational, multi-agential process by which anything becomes itself. And then ask yourself what it means to call that whole set of productions itself a kind of participation in divinity. That's one way to do it.